Hello again, uh, my name is Ian Cohen. I am the founder of Tara and one of the co-hosts for the ATL Education Expo. And I am here today for another insight conversation with Dr. Rihanna Mason, uh, the, a research scientist at the Urban Child Center, uh, Study Center, sorry, at Georgia State University, as well as the co-founder of the Academic Pipeline Project. Um, we're really excited to speak with you today, doctor, and uh, welcome, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Ian. It's great to be here. Awesome. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into. You have a fascinating story that touches on a lot of different pieces of education. And part of the reason we're doing these is to help people understand, like there are a lot of pathways in education to continue to have an impact, and also a lot to learn from from each other, especially here in Metro Atlanta. So I'd love to start the conversation just by getting a high level view of what your path in and around education in Atlanta has been. You know, how did you get into it in the first place, and then what are some of the stops you made along the way? So my first touch with education here in metropolitan Atlanta was when I became an undergraduate student at Spelman College. So I moved from Baltimore, Maryland to attend um, college in Atlanta. Um, I enrolled as a psychology major. Um, while I was there, I took you know classes that were required for my major as well as cross-registering to take classes at Morehouse College, Morse Brown, and Emory. Oh, okay. um, you hit a bunch of stuff. I also, I did. I took full advantage of being able to cross register and go to these other campuses. Um, yeah. It was exciting to get various perspectives um, and also to fill some of my electives that weren't currently offered at Spelman at the time. Sure. Um, I was also part of um, a research training program called the National Institutes of Health careers and opportunities um, in research or NIMCOR. And that gave me exposure um, to some of these other campuses, um, to what it was like to conduct research in the field of psychology. Psychology is so broad. We touch almost every other space. So being able to see what people do in real life was very helpful. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then I also worked at Morehouse School of Medicine, which was across the street. But part of what I did was keep up with the resource library for a couple of programs, the um, Elementary Science Education Partners Program. It was called ESEP. I think it was funded then by Emory, um, but went out to elementary schools in Metro Atlanta and gave science lessons. So oh. I was in the fourth in fifth grade classrooms, yeah. talking about Venn diagrams and figuring out what kids were eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, showing them how light bulbs work and you know all of that yeah. fun stuff. Um, I also worked with the Ben Carson Academy, um, which was a um, year-wide and summer program then. And I think Morehouse School of Medicine through their outreach programs still has similar programs um, that they're tra training you know, young students as well as high school students. I right. know we took high school students for travel um, to conferences to expose them to wow. what um, health, cool. health and science career are like. Yes, it was exciting yeah. to be a college student, <laughs> you know, <laughs> taking high school students to conferences, yeah. but it is still something that I love doing, mentoring students along their um, career pathway. So um, that's how I started as a student. And then I went to graduate school. I stayed in the South, went to South Carolina, did some work in Florida, ended back up here in Georgia. Huh. And so now I'm at Georgia State. Yeah. Um, and so I've been teaching for over 20 years now. Um, I started from, I think, 2006, teaching classes in the psychology department. And I went to a small rural town, Franklin Springs, Georgia, um, and taught there for a while and then returned back to Georgia State. Yeah. So I love teaching college students. I love yeah. showing them how to bring their concepts to life. Yeah. And anytime I have um, the opportunity to get back into uh, K through 12 classrooms is exciting as well. And that's what I do for my research and evaluation work. Now. Gotcha. Okay, we're well, definitely gonna dive into the research and evaluation part. I wanna, I wanna note one thing, that the idea that taking high school students to conferences 
I feel like that's such that's still a great idea. I, why are we not doing that? I mean, that seems really cool. I when I was in college, one of the reasons I got into teaching in the first place was because some teachers came to me and said, "Hey, could we bring our students to Emory?" I went to Emory undergrad, and okay. uh, that was my first exposure to high school students. It was setting them up with um, a day in the life of a college student experience at Emory. But those exposure experiences are so powerful. And I'm curious why you think, I mean, maybe I'm not seeing it, but I didn't even know that people used to do that. Why are they not doing that anymore? So I think they are still doing it. I think raising awareness and how to find those opportunities, um, that touches on what the Academic Pipeline Project does. So of course. that is the very mission of our company is to provide a resource that you can search nationwide to find these co-curricular opportunities or things that your own school is sponsoring okay. so that you can have that early exposure. But yeah. I do think you're right in certain places, they may not be as available or they're selected spots. Right. Um, so that's one of the things COVID has done well. It has mm -hmm. opened up the opportunities internationally. So now we can have spaces like this where you can take advantage of going to other campuses virtually, you know, it still may not be the same of, you know, walking around a green space and all of that, but you can see and talk to students, talk to faculty. And yes, so raising awareness, I think is the key. I think those opportunities are there, getting that information into the right people's hands and um, advertising it mm -hmm. and getting parents excited, I yep. think, you know, it's going to be the thing that we need to to do and really uh, ramp up over yeah. the years. I mean, we'll, we'll definitely come back to this now that I know it's like such a critical part of your story and your venture, um, your organization, because I think there's also a misconception out there that students wouldn't be interested in going to these things, which is just wrong. You know, like high school students are a lot more intellectually curious than they're generally given credit for. And I remember vividly a couple of years ago, I was chatting with a group of students that uh, one of our expo partners, Next Generation Men and Women works with, and they had taken themselves to the local like science festival um, conference. And they were like, they would go to the video gaming uh, things, like they got into the Cody stuff. They went on their own. They didn't even, we didn't even have to tell them about it. They're like, oh yeah, we're already going to that. It's like, we underestimate some of these kids. We do. And I'm glad you brought up science fairs because there are regional science fairs and there are the statewide science fairs. I give right. back by judging at the statewide. Okay. It's the GSEF one that happens at UGA. And there are a lot of talented innovators and curious yeah. um, students all the way from middle school. So they have middle school participants. So uh, you can take it back to sixth right. grade and participate. Um, so whatever teachers are doing to get them excited, to make it all the way to state, you're right. That's what we need to be doing more of and yeah. have. Yeah, like I mean, we can talk about science seasonal. all day. I, I remember when I was like seven or eight, my one of my brothers uh, was in had a science fair at his middle school, and I remember going to it. And I still remember to this day our neighbor had built this little model of like a it was an automated trash like collection thing, and it just like was super cool. And like that stuff, I feel like is so sticky for kids and also super inspiring. Um, not the road we're going to go down here right now, but such an interesting topic. So you. Uh, your time in Franklin Springs, you just mentioned, was that in K-12, just to clarify? No, it was at the college level. Got it, okay. So, so, so um, you, while I was there, I, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're good. I want to hear about No, I was going to say I had some touch with high school students because um, the college had uh, dual enrollment classes. So we did sure. have juniors and seniors coming to campus to take like introduction to psychology or mm -hmm. human growth and development. Yep. We also had a peer mentoring program where we matched college students with high school students uh, um, to tutor them in certain subjects. So, sure. but I was hired there as a professor. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So I'd love to hear more about your research. So you, you know, went into academia and research. Tell us one, you know, 
I would love to hear what that process of deciding to go into academia was like, because I know today, especially it's, it's very hard to find professorship positions, especially in COVID. Um, so for you, when you were thinking about that pathway, what led you there? And then ultimately, what was your pursuit once you got in there? Well, my pathway, I think, wasn't always destined for academia. Mm -hmm. So I've always been intrigued by science, science fiction, um, yeah. technology, all of that. And when I first came to Spelman, I actually thought I was going to be a lawyer. I wanted, I saw the science fiction film where they put um, persons into this virtual reality space and they had them live out their prison sentences. And oh, the funny wow. thing was, if you made it through the virtual reality, your heart rate didn't go up a whole lot, mm -hmm. you were guilty. Cause it was like, you were spending the time you should have been and you were okay with it. But if yeah. all your bodily functions went all awry, you were innocent. So wow. I actually thought, Ooh, that would be a great way to create this program. I could make a lot of money as an attorney. Cause I would know if people were innocent or guilty. Uh then I started reading the constitution and the laws and all these things. Right. And I really right, decided right. that I was more interested in learning about the brain, learning in general. Yeah. And so then I started on this research pathway. So I went to graduate school to learn more about how we learn information. And I studied word learning in particular. Okay. Um, I had a childhood friend who um, struggled in her elementary like English classes sure. but she learned Japanese very well oh. and I was like how can we learn a different language but then struggle with some of the the nuances of our our own language so right. I started designing studies to figure out how we learned words that weren't actual real words in the English language mm -hmm. but we could use the context from the sentences to figure figure that out so that kind of led me down a pathway I was really excited about that when I left graduate school I went to a specialized research center the Florida Center for Reading Research and everyone there was engaged in this research pathway so I started doing research full-time I had some teaching involvement and I was able to um, be on these interdisciplinary teams with psychologists, educators, speech language pathologists, go out into some of the local schools and really solve problems. And that's something I still enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, but then the opportunity came to work at Georgia State and to do both teaching and research. Um, and so that's the pathway that I have um gotcha. stayed on so right. are you it still, gives me are you still pursuing the um it sounds like that's really sort of in the in literacy or a lot of teachers are called literacy is that still your line of research mm -hmm. where has that taken you over the last few years yes it's still the line of research um so i'm still involved um in projects at the urban child study center where we work with um evaluating the state's uh literacy initiative or l4ga so looking at how literacy interventions are working statewide um, and the students that are involved are from pre-k all the way through 12th grade some of the areas are vocabulary learning and then reading comprehension as well right. some of the other work we've done um, is more related to professional development but still in the space of how um, educators are teaching literacy skills and what are you finding are, are we doing it right Yes, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of awesome yeah. things. I can't rate anyone yeah, sure. in, in particular um, because what the interventions are a little bit different, but um, we definitely know that there are unique things that educators are doing that we definitely want to understand so that we can share that uniqueness. I think in a presentation, we called it the secret sauce, just like Chick-fil-A sauce. Something mm -hmm. goes into making that Chick-fil-A sauce, or even there's a lot of different ways people make tea. So what is it that educators are using in their classrooms that then are allowing students to learn and maintain that learning over time? So is there anything that's just been really consistent? Like this usually is a foundational practice that has been proven to be very effective. Like what's working? Wow. Um, 
Well, I will say something that is consistent that um, districts that have had um, the opportunity to learn from the professional development, um, they're, they're taking time to learn about their student in detail. They're looking at the assessments that they're giving yeah. um, and not just you know one time over a variety of times. So they're using it to inform um, the instruction. I don't think because the entire evaluation work is not complete yet, we can't um, right. you know, give you know, more precise findings. But I think what I just said has been shared in other- I got you. Um, yeah, and I want to respect the, I want to respect the research process. I mean, if any, I think one of the challenges, I'm curious if, if from your angle and perspective, you know, I was talking earlier today with another educator and how, you know, K-12 especially, like, it feels like every couple of years, there's like a new thing. There's like a new pull in a different direction. And very rarely does it feel like we get, we take the time not only to like study these methods in depth and give them time to breathe and like get actual large samples and results, um, but also give give the educators time to get good at implementing these things, right? I think that's another part of this that I'm sure you see a lot of, and uh, it's you know Common Core is a great example of like a new you know relatively new at this point, but initiative mm -hmm. that really wasn't given a huge chance or huge runway before people started chopping at it. You know, say what you want about it. I don't even know the details you know behind the academic underpinnings, but again, mm -hmm. I. I feel like from an academic perspective, hopefully you all get a chance to be a little bit more, um, take the long view of certain things. Do you find that's the case? And do you also, how do you all react when you see some of these new initiatives or um, you know, emphasis on different things? Do you think it's short-sighted or do you think it's, it's oftentimes based on something that's, that's important or both? Um, well, I definitely think time is a factor. And I think, um, as I mentioned, you know, looking at how children are learning at multiple intervals is important. But as you said, um, adjusting to what's happening, especially like now in the time of COVID, you know, there's going to be lessons that we can learn now from how teachers have been adjusted their implementation of instruction. Um, you know, maybe we can pull some, um, key takeaways for later that we can keep doing because now we've learned how to better differentiate instruction. Sure. Um, and then I think to your question about some of the new things that are coming about, I do know that in this space, there is a cycle and mm -hmm. we come back to some of the same questions and approach it from a different way. The terminology changes um, and because I'm interested in words, you know, yeah. going back to see, okay, was this, you know, there was a reading war back in the sixties. Right. And then yeah, what happened? The word wall. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, is it the same thing? Is it different or have we just found a different way, you know, to attack yeah. it? So I think the messaging sometimes may get in the way, but the fundamental, you know, principles, um, we're identifying new things and we're getting better at um, then translating that information. So we're make, we're connecting the dots. I think that's- yeah. Well, I think that makes sense, especially given like our ability to share information and learn from different places around the world too now is so much better than it used to be. Um, but I was having this exact same conversation actually with a gentleman earlier today who, I think it was earlier today, um, who, he runs a, um, I guess you could call it a enrichment program, but where they utilize Legos as the basis of science and math learning. And it started as an after school program. Now they actually do, um, you know, common core aligned stuff in the classroom too. And it's like, you know, Legos came out in like the sixties or seventies. And we've had conversations about how STEAM and STEM really have a lot of their underpinnings from vocational education and those practice, like applied learning is the theme that keeps coming back. And so I'm curious, like, if we keep coming back to some themes, at what point should we, should we just say to ourselves, maybe we just need to structurally change the system so that it embeds this more? Is that something that you think about as you see these cycles? I do. I do think about the structural changes. I think 
we're evolving and technology is evolving. And I think that that's one of the things that's going to come. There are ideas that we had that the technology wasn't there. So yeah. the world wasn't quite ready for our ideas. Yeah. And we went, may have been limited in how we implemented them. But now that the technology is there and we can interface student knowledge with knowledge bases that exist in other places. I mean, there's so much more that we can give people touch with information faster. Yeah. We can train educators, you know, on the self-paced platforms. And right. like I said, we're exposing people to international um, work and international educators. So we can learn from all spaces much more easily than we could in the past. Yeah. Resources, you know, I think some of those barriers are going away with knowing that we can have these virtual meetings now where we right. couldn't have afforded it to fly to Greece to learn from the expert there, you know, yeah. now we just need to get up early enough you know, right. to set up the meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I'm going to, I want to ask one more question along this line of thought before we get into the um, academic pipeline project. And I, I'm, so there's a, I have this belief and it's been echoed in a lot of these conversations that if you sit down with anybody who works in education like this, and especially outside of a school building or um, you know their professional setting, and you ask them like structurally, do you like where the system's at? Pretty much everybody's like, no, like we need to change. And we've had the same structure. We were all in almost universal agreement that we should change this because to your point, what's expected, uh, what what's expected of students has changed, but also what, what it takes to be a, you know, a thriving human being in our society has changed, right? And so we need students to be more dynamic, adaptable, resilient, all these things, just like, and we need a system that can be that way too. And I, I'm, I'm curious, like, if it's not the people, it's the structures, like, why do you think, um, you know, having had a vantage point where you look at the system in a critical way for so long, why do you think we're not seeing more structural change um, as opposed to, kind of recycling a lot of the old themes we've used before. So what barriers are <laughs> there to implementing best practices? <laughs> that's that's um, a practical way to put the question for sure. Yeah. Um, that might be tied into, I think, the very essence of the first part of what you asked. Why is it that the educators in the space are doing so many things outside of their primary job. Yeah. So we have this passion mm -hmm. to change the world, right? change our students, um, share all the knowledge we have. And we normally see students in need, um, needing new knowledge, different knowledge, different ways. Right. And we try to solve the problem. So I think probably part of how we're trained is to look at things critically. So we're always critiquing what's there. Yeah, fair point. And we're coming up with these solutions. So we become experts and we want to share our expert knowledge in a way and make that knowledge more widespread. I know that um, is why we started the Academic Pipeline Project. We wanted to make knowledge more widespread. We wanted to take the experiences that may have only been given to some or certain groups and elevate, you know, this is the history of these um, training programs, co-curricular activities. This is how it's impacted others to give that spark and inspiration. Um, but I think the other side of that is we're doing all these things and that's part of the barrier, right? We're dividing our time. We have these competing mm -hmm. priorities yeah. and slow, so that change then becomes slow because right. we don't have enough um, resources and time. Now that leads into sharing where I see us later because the mm -hmm. technology is evolving that we may not have to do it all anymore. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you said a lot of things that resonate with me there. And I think th the teachers tend to bear the brunt of all of the new ideas that everybody else has. You know, it's like, 
Uh, I remember when social emotional learning started coming into the, the lexicon a couple of years ago, and now it's like, oh yeah, teachers will just do that too. It's like, you want me to teach history and social emotional learning. And I think at some mm -hmm. point we need to either decouple a lot of this stuff and like, let's just have a class on social emotional learning or even just emotional learning mm -hmm. or even just empathy, mm -hmm. you know, like you could really dive deep or let's like really build an integrated experience. Um, but right now, if we try to do all of these things at once, we're going to do none of them really well. And there's so many confounding variables too. It's like, mm -hmm. how do you know what's really having an impact? Um, so mm -hmm. it's quite well taken. So I want to ask, tell me more about the academic pipeline project. So what's the, the mission and why did you start it? Um, so the academic pipeline project really started as a brainstorming idea at the oh, end of a does. conference. So, um, <laughs> my colleague and I were giving a presentation about decolonizing academia. Hmm. And so we were talking about, um, organizations and programs that really give students a space, um, to learn, learn in their unique ways and really, you know, elevate them to the next level in the academy. Um, and we decided to write a book, um, which yeah. is called Academic Pipeline Programs, um, Diversifying the Bachelors to the Professoriate. And the way that we organized it um, is around this index tool that we created. One of the things we thought, you, um, you were saying terms change, you know, we keep going in this cycle. You yeah. mentioned social, emotional, is it nurturing? Is it empathy? You know, what is it? So we knew we needed a common language yeah. <laughs> to talk about all of these programs because they all are doing similar things, but right. they're titled in different ways. Yeah. So we made this Thrive Index tool to characterize all these programs. Oh, so yeah. in the book, Rosetta we talk Stone about- for, for terminology, it sounds like. Yes. Sort of, sort of, okay. um, but it does allow us to, to build um, a database of these programs that then you can look at them in the okay. same way. Gotcha. So um, we start at the beginning of the pipeline and we talk about the KIPP schools. We mm -hmm. talk about the Meyerhoff program, which is in, that started at the University of Maryland and that other schools have now um, replicated. We talk about College Advising Corps. There's a College Advising Corps here at Georgia yeah. State. Um, we talk about other programs um, like the Ford Foundation, which I received a fellowship from them and uh, all of what they do. Um, yeah. Things like Sisters of the Academy, which is a, a, available for faculty members to get professional development. So we go from K through 12 all the way um, to faculty. What are these programs that have been around on average for 20 years? What have they done? What is their success story? How did they start? And how have they you know, evolved over time? And then we make people aware of things like Teach for America or TRIO programs like Upward Bound and the McNair right. program. Um, how do you apply for those? What's the value to you as a parent? What's the value to an institution also to be able to have upward bound students come for preview day on uh, campus? Yeah. And what sort of the way that you should be thinking about um, introducing career pathways um, through co-curricular um, experiences? So mm -hmm. that's the book. The, the company then is designing this interactive database, which I hope will evolve over time where we can fit characteristics of people looking for opportunities to the opportunities that exist and then keep up with that, you know, over time. But right now we're at the phase of trying to get institutions and programs to take our Thrive Index tool so that we can have that common language for enough programs for, you know, consumers to really look at all levels of the pipeline. So, so is, it for, is it for any specific set of students or is it for anyone who's really trying to, you know, learn and level up to the next, you know, whatever their, their goal is? Great question, because we did prioritize diversity as a theme. And so um, in our first chapter of the book, we talk about why a lot of these programs started to serve 
um, diverse groups and across all of what diversity means. So not just for black students, not just for Latina students, but for low income um, or students exposed to poverty, um, first generation for those with um, disabilities abilities, right. different, you know, language backgrounds, all of that. So it's really putting all of what we call our social identity characteristics, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. in, in one place. So um, I think if you are of a majority group in one area, there may still be some areas where you're underrepresented. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, yeah, for sure. So when it's when it's achieved when you've achieved the vision of the academic pipeline project, what does that look like? Like, give me a give me a use case of somebody who's gonna you know open this thing up and and what happens for them. Okay, so I'll talk from the parents' perspective because sure. this is you know we talked about educators doing things because we want to solve a problem. So, as a parent of two boys in different grades, right. I take a lot of time trying to search for things that they can be involved in to foster their career pathways. One is interested in marine life. The other one is interested in, I'd say, just making money. So maybe entrepreneurship, but also in some STEM related things as well. So at the end of the day, I'd like to be able to search faster Mm -hmm. for programs, not just open up like the parents magazine and look through all the titles and mark Mm -hmm. them up with a highlighter, but go into an, yes, there's a parents (laughs) magazine and I still read it. Yes. Hey, I'm not a parent. I'm just ignorant on this. I admit that. No, but yes, there are full parents magazines. They're at the grocery store. There are other places. Sure. And yes, oftentimes there's a special issue that has like, where are all the summer camps? Where are all, uh, yeah. you know, the Lego robotics themed, you know, right. activities. And then oftentimes we get emails or we get word of mouth. So we want to put all that information into this database, have it um, visualized in a way that's easily um, accessible. Mm-hmm. But if I'm searching for fourth grade maybe I want some identity related information for my son you know my husband has a perspective but maybe I want him to get other male perspectives so I can find um you know that type of programming so not only do I want him to be um trained in marine life but I want him to work on his identity as a as a black male and I feel Um, like you know, I, I've seen some resources, especially COVID has accelerated this a lot, right? Like I remember a month into COVID last year, I saw like a bunch of companies come together and try to build a database to sort all the content, like all the curriculum they had available. And you look at it and it, I don't know if this is, it's, this sounds like where you guys are trying to take a different tact, um, but for it was, it was pretty generic. It was like, we've got like a thousand resources you can sort by grade level, and you can sort by subject. And it's like, I, you know, we're to the point now where we need more nuance, right? We need more like perspective and angles on that. It sounds like that's what you all are trying to do as part of what you're building. Yes, we're trying to, to step the just standard searchable database up a level, not only um, so it could be tailored and like I said, personalized. So eventually I think down the road, if we have, I fill out, I have a, like I said, rising fourth grader, male, mm-hmm. interested in doing this. Yep. Then I've given a lot of information that can be used right away to go right. in and find things that are useful because I don't know it all, right? As a parent, I don't know what's out there. I don't even know the right way to search sometimes. So right. taking kind of the wants and desires and then learning from that over time. So what if I just went in and every time I, I put Morehouse and Clark Atlanta, because I'm loyal to the Atlanta University Center, yeah. right? So maybe yeah. now you returned um, the majority of programs that are at the Atlanta University Center. Wow. Now I don't have to open up Morehouse's page, Clark's page, Spellman's yeah. page, Morehouse, I mean, Morris Brown's page, or Morehouse School of Medicine's page. I get them right there. Right. Um, and then I think this I don't know if I should let this out of the bag, but what if you had that personal assistant Mm. 
to do this back and forth, almost like a virtual counselor or coach. Yeah. Um, my husband is a basketball coach. He mm -hmm. spends a lot of hours putting together practice plans. Yeah. Why can't we have play by plays for our academic journey journey? Yeah. Why can't we be coached along the way and keep up with? So I've already signed my son up for, you know, a virtual one week tour of a, you know, um, science museum. Oh, cool. That's context, right? So do I want my son to do that again? No, I want him to right. do, maybe I want to take him to Baltimore now, maybe to a different aquarium or something yeah. like that. Yeah, but I'm maybe sure. I want to enrich his experience beyond here's an aquarium and this is what people do at an aquarium he needs to be taken to the next level right and coaches of sports do this in their heads all the time they yeah. look at film of an athlete they know if they need to work on for basketball you know their shots or right. you know jumping higher so watch that same sort of information for us and not just a fourth grader but when you're in college when you're teaching so yeah. at your level now, Ian, what else do you want to work on, you know, in your future and then find those programs that will help you get better? Yeah, no, I love things. that. I love that. Because I think if you take a step back, like the themes I hear coming out of that, and I personally would love to hear more about this offline because um, I have a lot of thoughts. I think we make it so hard to, we make it so hard for people to continue to learn and grow in our culture, especially after you get out of the public education system. Like we should be making it as easy as possible for adults to find more ways to learn, right? Like that, that seems like it would be a good thing for society. And I think what you're talking about is one, we need better curation of what's out there currently, right? Like centralization mm -hmm. of course, and then more sophisticated curation. And the other thing that you mentioned that, that I'm hearing more and more from teachers is this idea that like your learning journey is cumulative, right? Like we mm -hmm. want to be able to have what we've done before impact what we get now. I was talking to one grade level chair um, at a KIPP school um, in Maryland recently, who was saying that she gets really frustrated because she's had new academic, she's had new instructional coaches each year. And each year they start from scratch. It's like, they've never, you know, they don't know anything about her past. And she's like, at this point, it's just, it's more compliance than it is growth for me. And I think that's a theme right. across all of education and learning, not even in K-12, but just more broadly, you know, we have to start really thinking about, okay, we've, I think people take things like Google um, as like, this is the best version of, of this thing. It's the best version for finding something on the internet maybe, but when you're talking about mm -hmm. actually going through a learning or growth journey, there's more we can do here with in, in mm -hmm. terms of the things that you're laying out. So I think that's really awesome and intriguing. And that leads me to my last question, which you've, you've certainly alluded to a little bit already. But when we think about uh, education, and we can use it as a broad term here, um, by the year 2050, so roughly 30 years from now, what do you think it should look like by that point? Because I think uh, we asked this question as hopefully as good educators, we kind of backwards plan. Let's design what we want um, based off the outcome we're trying to achieve. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. By 2050, what do you think the, the system should look like? We can keep it broad strokes. Don't have to give me all the specifics if, you know, who knows what, what we're going to have then. Mm -hmm. um, I really think by 2050, our mode of interacting with students and offering all of these um, opportunities for learning is really going to change. Mm. Um, and I mentioned earlier, I'm really intrigued by science fiction. Um, yeah. I really think stepping into a classroom <laughs> is going to look a lot different. And bringing that knowledge to us is going to look a lot different where what's in our, you know, devices. Right. Um, we can call on more readily. We already have Siri and Alexa. Yeah. Um, I feel like you're, you're hesitant. 
I, I, cause I'm really into sci-fi right now too. And I feel like you're hesitating on really throwing something crazy out there. Uh, you know, and, and trust me, I'm familiar with what they're doing with like Neuralink and things like adapting to our brains and all that kind of stuff. Is that, is that kind okay. of what you're getting at? That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting at. So we are building intelligent systems. And I think those intelligent systems are going to interface with us um yeah. much more differently so um there will still need be a need and a value for educators because we have to train these intelligent systems with right. best practices so i think sometimes um people may be um a little bit leery of artificial intelligence because they yeah. think it takes away jobs and things of that nature but someone still has to build it someone still has to train it the ex experts are still needed yep. and our form can be shared in a lot of different ways so i think mm -hmm. our touch as educators will also be expanded um you know based upon these um technological innovations so yeah i think um, i don't and i was going to say people also people you know we when you think of ai people think of like terminator or like you know robots that are gonna do all the jobs and anybody who knows where AI is at today knows that we're not that close to that. But also all of these mm -hmm. things, always they always create new opportunities and new fields and new spaces mm -hmm. and landscapes. So mm -hmm. I think the status quo will certainly change, but it always does, right? And so I think we over, I, to your point, the, the leeriness is you understand, it's understandable because we don't really know what's around the next corner, which is always nerve wracking. But I, I also mm -hmm. think to your point, we're the ones designing the future. And so mm -hmm. to take that in an active role as opposed to passive and, and view it for what it is, which is, it's an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity to really- Yes, it is an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Rihanna Mason, research scientist from the Urban Child Study Center at Georgia State University, also co-founder of the Academic Pipeline Project. Um, we really appreciate your insights, your work, your contributions to education, and also your time here today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, I didn't mention the book resource will be out in May of 2021. Oh, so it's right exactly. around the corner. Yeah, congrats. Yes, yes. Awesome. Um, and I just wanted to say, I didn't mention why I have on the shirt and I just Thank wanted you. to let yeah. the audience know yeah. that, you know, as we're thinking about future designers, we also have to remember who our pioneers are and mm -hmm. so I am wearing a shirt that mentions the first name of two pioneers in psychology, Inez and Martha. So Inez Beverly Prosser um, was the first African-American woman to get her doctoral degree in psychology. And Martha okay. Bernal was the first Latina woman to get her doctoral degree. Cool. And that's so I love come that. in full love circle. That. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll make sure to put that out as we put this video out too. Um, once again, it's been great. And we appreciate you. Thanks again.